I like the podcast style. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's freelance. It's just nice and loosey goosey. Yeah. And the brew time, is that what this is about? <laughs> it's, it's one of these, not a double entendre, but it's like one of these <laughs> double meanings because I do, I do have a beer sometimes when we're doing this, you know, it helps to relax sure. everybody and helps the conversation sure. flow. But obviously my name's Bruce as well. So the brew time sort of fits those two things in, as you said, it's basically, it's just people come on here and we have a chat. We have a conversation about whatever it is that's uh, special in their life and, you know, what their story is basically so it's it's, that's all it is most of the time it involves bikes but not always great um my life revolves around motorcycles Uh, yeah not so much the racing and riding part i'm a fabricator i love riding don't get me wrong bruce uh, I love racing motorcycles. Sorry, I love the art and the science of racing motorcycles. I do not race, but I've right. been following the the local race scene f- for as long as I can remember, uh, more than 30 years, and uh, always had a bike. Um, I love building bikes that look like race bikes that can yeah. perform as well. <laughs> They're more uh, um, cosmetically beautiful as opposed to uh, they don't operate as well like a race bike should. They look like they, they're really fast, but they're not. But uh, I love building. I love fabricating. I love tinkering. Yeah. I, didn't, so, I didn't realize you were, a, you were a, a bike builder as well, a fabricator as well. That's how I kind of got into uh, the idea. And I'll say storytelling right now. But when I first started the idea of producing films and videos, I didn't know the value of storytelling. And I'm sure we'll get into that in a, in a little bit. But yeah, that's what I started with as a as a youngster, as far back as 10 years old, I was built uh, rebuilding. Um, wow. old, old mini bikes like mm-hmm. the Honda, the Honda 50, the mini trail. If you recall that bike, I know you're a bike guy, uh, but you I, don't I know am, that. I, I was quite late into bikes. I didn't get into bikes till 2008. So I didn't, oh. I don't, I didn't grow up with like bikes in my family or anything. It's just something I'd always wanted to do. And oh. as an adult at 32, I think I was or 30 odd, no, maybe late twenties. Actually, I, I, um, went for it and got my bike license. Sorry. Good for you. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, actually, my wife is just about to get her bike license after so Brilliant. many years of seeing me tinkering and riding. And uh, she's finally decided she's retired. Uh, mm-hmm. She's going to study for her test and maybe Fantastic. get her license. Yeah. How hard is it to get your bike? Like you're in Canada, aren't you? Yeah. Toronto. Toronto. Canada. Toronto. Gotcha. Yeah. So, I mean, I know in the States, the States might have changed things, I'm not sure, but I know it used to be incredibly easy to get your, your bike license in uh, the USA. Is Canada similar or are you more like the UK? We have you know a series of modules that you have to go through. Series of modules. The first yeah. one is a written test. You have to understand uh-huh. the road. And with her experience driving a car, she should have no problem with signs and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, and you also have to understand the controls of the of the motorcycle on paper. So she uh, will be going through some testing, uh, understanding and explaining how the controls are. And then wow. she's given a, a, a right to practice driving on the road. She'll be limited to uh, no highway riding and mm-hmm. no nighttime riding. Um, I'll, I'll guide her through that whole process and a speed limit of uh, 80 kilometers per hour. That's the max she could ride. Gotcha. Uh, and then that's for 90 days. And if she feels confident, she can go for her license at that point. Wow. And, uh, 90 days. Yeah. Three months. That's right. Wow. Here, here in the UK, we have to do something called the CBT initially. You know, um, there's, there's lots of different ways you can, you can get your full bike license in the UK, but, everybody has to do a CBT first, which is compulsory basic training. So that's similar to what you said. Um, you know, you get shown around the controls of a bike. It's just a one, two, five CC. Uh, you do some stuff you spend like the morning up to lunchtime oh. off the off, off road, you know, not, not in the dirt, but you know, round a, a secure area, you do cone work, you, you learn all the controls of the bike, all this sort of stuff, but it's a morning. And then in the afternoon, if they're happy that you're proficient enough, they'll move you and you then go out onto the road. But again, there's no motorway or anything like that, but it's a one day course that you have to do here. And right. then you can then 
do the modules. We have that option. That's a, an right. option to do, and she will be doing that. It's a school. Uh, I think one of the colleges locally here runs an operation over two okay. days, and it's in a parking lot, and they do what you just described. Gotcha. Uh, but gotcha. in Canada, we don't actually have to take that. She can go right from the 90 days right into a, a real test. That right, is, gotcha. Which I think is uh, used to be just in an enclosed area. I'm not sure if they actually go on the road, but it's it's likely very similar to what, what you do in Europe. Gotcha, gotcha. Right, Hang so on. let's let's scoot back yeah. then and your okay. your sort of history into the bike world. We'll cover this incredible TV show which uh, oh. you're on here to chat about, but let's find out a little bit more about you first. So okay. the biking history. Yes, goes back to uh, I believe I was ten or eleven. Uh, but slightly before that, a trip to Europe with my parents, I fell in love with the Kawasaki 900. They, yeah. my, ne my uncle at that time, uh, God rest his soul, gave me a beautiful die cast metal uh, model of uh, a Kawasaki. I think it was a 900. I'm not, I don't remember. I certainly don't have the model anymore, but it was a beautiful bike. It was a fairly large scale. And mm. I just fell in love with how the suspension worked, the exhaust pipes, the four exhaust pipes coming out of the motor. I just fell in love with bikes. I'm a little, as a little boy, I was into motor vehicles. So uh, I guess it was about age 11 or 12. Um, uh, someone who was really nice gave me a Honda uh, Mini Trails, a 50cc engine, a little four-stroke yeah. motorcycle. Uh, it didn't work very well, uh, so I used it for a little bit, but I, I guess I got kind of tired of um, not having it so reliable, so I got right into working on the uh, the whole thing. Disassembled mm -hmm. my thing, to, even today, I do it today for friends and, and other colleagues, um, they'll give me a bike that's in bad shape. Uh, just recently, a fella gave me uh, a, a 1980 MX-80. It's a Yamaha, kind of like a trail bike. Uh -huh. uh, his son thought it was going to the scrap. And he says, I'm going to do a little trick on him. He gave Brilliant. it to me for about four months, and I turned it into something that looks uh, original, almost brand new. And uh, he, uh, he gave it to his son for Christmas. Oh, and wow. That, I bet he yeah. was made up. I fell in love with that 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 whole little story that his son wasn't expecting it, and then boom, he gets it. I yeah. even found the original decals uh, that were not the Yamaha decals, but I think the, one of them was a Fox sticker, mm -hmm. and uh, I stuck it on the tank how his son had originally uh, placed it. And uh, anyway, that was that was a, a nice nice build. I uh, I love stripping down and reassembling. I love the cleaning process. The it's kind of laborious the the degreasing process but it's critical yeah uh, and then the reassembly now you're working on clean parts uh you replace bearings you replace springs you you're, you you've got the motor now in your hand if it's small enough uh and you uh you get to function and and and, and make it work um yeah I, I really enjoy it i've done at least 20 30 odd bikes in my career and it's wow. it's a hobby it was all passion bruce um, can I interrupt for one moment? Of there could be, there could, there's, what a coincidence. Today we're having two windows replaced in the house and yeah. I can hear them doing some hammering and drilling. I hope it doesn't interfere with what we're, what our there, conversation There's nothing is. coming through at my end. Okay, good, great. Uh, and you might hear a dog bark, uh, but that's good, I'm sure. <laughs> I should have covered this. My my wife, uh, she's leaving very shortly, so I will be uh, home alone with our dog. And oh, okay. she'll probably she'll probably get a bit lonely and start scratching at the door. So <laughs> these things happen. Don't worry about yeah, it. No I love it. Love dogs. Um, yeah. So, so the the, yeah. the love of bikes. Yeah. So um, like when I was uh, with the Honda Fifty, I, I actually uh, when I went into um, high school, my 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 first high school experience. I was thirteen, grade nine. I uh, I was part of the auto mechanics group, and of course, I brought the bike in. Uh, as a as a project for all the students as well as myself to rebuild the motor, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I don't think it needed the rebuild, but I just wanted to do it right just to <laughs> to, to get it back up and running and the experience of tear down and reassembly. Yeah, parts back then weren't as expensive as they are today, um, and uh, but uh, they're available today actually uh, surprisingly. 
Um, eBay has been such a, a savior when it came when it comes to finding parts for these old motorcycles. Absolutely. If it's a Jap if it's a Japanese motorcycle, you likely will find the parts. Um, maybe the uh, the Italian bikes, uh, the older ones, a bit more of a challenge. I usually don't take on projects for Italian bikes, <laughs> although they're beautiful and pretty. Uh, they're a bit of a challenge to service and to, to locate parts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've, I've had an experience of owning an Aprilia, and I know they're a lot better now, but mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. I had one, it lived up to the reputation. Looked amazing, sounded amazing. It yes. was a nightmare to live with, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it evolved from there. Once the Honda Mini Trail, actually, I gave, when I left high school, uh, was it when I left? Yeah, when I left high school, I uh, I actually donated the bike to the school, so I'm still I'm, I'm sure it's still there. My uh, my beloved uh, auto mechanic teacher, he has since passed away, but I believe the bike is still in the uh, the auto class. So maybe the the new fourteen year olds, the new grade niners, uh, they uh, they take a stab at repairing it. And Absolutely, it. yeah, you're passing it on, passing it on. Yeah. So the the, the next series of motorcycles. I don't think I can remember them all. Maybe I could. Uh, the next bike was a, a YZ100. I got into motocross. I lived very close to um, uh, a ravine uh, that was miles and miles of paths along a river. And I would make my way down there uh, as illegal as it was. The, the police mm. weren't as, uh, as effective back then. They didn't really pay too much attention. We lived on a little bit of the outskirts. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's no longer outskirts, mind you. Uh, but uh, yeah, I enjoyed my, my time with uh, a few friends riding through high school years with many different kinds of motocross bikes, trail bikes. Didn't get my first road bike until I think it was about 20. 22 or 21 and that right. was a neat bike that was a 72 rd 350 uh -huh. um, it was uh, an old two-stroke that was a fun machine um <laughs> that's a collector now isn't it it certainly is i don't have it yeah i don't have it any longer but that was that was a, a lovely machine um which uh which uh really was easy to maintain because of the two-stroke nature mm -hmm. right um i love two stroke two stroke and the smell of two stroke is where my heart belongs i, I know <laughs> nothing about mechanics but you're oh. right it's the smell the smell yeah. just doesn't it that yeah. two stroke smell you're just like something about yeah. it some of the oils there's a there's a particular brand can i say brands over the uh, of course you can. say okay. whatever you like on here okay great uh clots clots makes this uh, very uh, cherry flavored, I think it's strawberry or cherry flavored or scented uh, oil. So right. you, 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 when you're riding on a, on a, on a trail, you, you know someone's uh, been around if you can smell the cherries or the strawberries. <laughs> it's a very fruity scent in the air. Yeah. It's a really lovely smell. Um, but uh, yeah, so went through the paces of uh, college and uh, owned a couple of road bikes then. Um, most of these bikes, Bruce, I got to tell you, I, I'm a fair weather rider and I don't race. I do do uh, track days. I have mm -hmm. done track days in the past and it's just not in me to, I don't have the skill uh, or the brain power to, uh, to race in, you know, in and around 20 odd guys that are just going for broke, right? They are uh, a different breed, aren't they? Oh aren't my they? God. You you think Boy. you think you're a fairly proficient rider. You think, yeah, I'm not too bad. I can hold my own here. When you actually get on track against people who can ride a bike, it's just a different level. It's just, different. they're just not wired the same as us. Yeah, and I've always been intrigued by that. I've got several photographs. I, I used to play around with my camera back in the uh, 80s and 90s, and I would often go to local racetracks, and I would just feast on photographing the motorcycles, but certainly the riders working mm. on their bikes. And um, I was never really good at um, sport photography, so I tried to develop that. I got some good photographs of the bikes going at speed on, in turns mm. or – um, in, in full flight at say 200 kilometers an hour, panning is, a, is an incredible skill to have with, uh, with a good camera. Uh, maybe in my career, I've caught one really good photograph <laughs> at speed, but I uh, used to love going to the tracks and I've made friends 
um, at the tracks and um, yeah, my background is is definitely hands on and uh, a creative fabrication kind of a, a, a personality that I have. Mm -hmm. I love art. Uh, I love music. Uh, I, I love. Um, I, I play guitar, and I, I really enjoy it. I'm just a student of the guitar, but it's just another way to get your creative senses out. Yeah. And uh, that kind of led me into becoming a. Um, when I when I would edit my photographs, I would use Photoshop, and I became a, a Photoshop hack. I never took lessons on how to use Photoshop, but I came, I became quite good. Um, and that led me into. Um, how I love the art of filming. I, uh, I, I discovered it late in my career. Um, and uh, I've rented some quality cameras. I've used today's iPhones are incredible. You, you yeah. would know that as well. Um, but uh, I, uh, I used to love filming when I, I would go to the track and editing was a skill set that I had to develop if I wanted to present my storytelling in video format. So uh, in and let, let's go back to 2011 when I just built my pri I just built my prize motorcycle. Um, it uh, it created an interesting network for me uh, because I presented it at uh, the the Toronto International Motorcycle Show uh, mm -hmm. two years in a row. It won first place, and wow. here's a guy who's a garage mechanic. Um, who uh, just loves the, the the idea of racing the racing motorcycle, the science and art of it, mm -hmm. and uh, I uh, got the help of a lot of really cool people, a lot of interesting fabricating people, and met lots of interesting people. And one of them was a, a retired director from a, a broadcast network here in, in Canada, and I uh, I had an idea uh, back in. I guess it was 2000, before I started building this bike, I had an idea for an interesting reality show. And uh, it evolved. I, uh, I, if, if we had more than an hour, I'd start right from the beginning, but I'll make it short We've, as possible. We have as long as, you've, as you, oh. you want, Jerry, honestly. There are no time oh, wow. limits on this podcast. <laughs> oh, that's great. So, cause as long as I you want. I love talking about this stuff, especially when I have someone who uh, I can bend their ear. Um, <laughs> the experience is wonderful. It's, it really is. Accomplishing any major task requires a lot of people. Um, you can't do everything yourself, although sometimes you feel like you're doing everything yourself. Mm. Um, I, uh, I decided to put together a story and start pitching a story for a show. Uh, back then, it was a reality show. Today, it's less of a reality show. It's more of a, a mix of a, a documentary, kind of you're covering the sports, so it's sport coverage, but it's really about the people. It's storytelling. It's a, you said it at the top of our, our conversation. I want to find, and it's easy, I want to find compelling people, and anyone who races a bike is compelling yeah. It, yeah. you you said it yourself right um i didn't know how important it is to to capture story back when i first started but it really is truly about the story it's not about the bikes the bikes are there the racing is there the event is there uh, but it's really getting to know the people and, and bending their ears and listening to them and yes. just letting them much like what i'm doing just ramble on but eventually <laughs> you, you get you really get deep into what drives them, what motivates them, what makes life worth living for them, right? Absolutely. Um, so Everyone has a story, don't they? But some some are better than others in conveying that story. Some you yes. have to really dig quite hard, don't you, to, to get in there and discover what it is that makes them tick and, and ooze that out of them. Oh, you said you said a, a lot there, Bruce. Um, the the skill of forming your questions to mm. get to the core really quick. You, you, as an interviewer, you have to be very patient with the interviewee, and you have to guide them. You have to let them uh, bring out what is in their soul. Yeah. Um, and uh, often enough, it's pretty easy uh, when you when you talk about racing and motorcycles with these people, they they love to do it. So you get to the point pretty damn quick. Yeah. You know, um, so um, I met this director fella, a retired guy. He listened to my story. He helped me hone 
what I'm trying to present. And that's critical. Since day one, the, the, the title of the show has changed. Uh, it started with the idea of uh, cafe rider, right? Uh, the all super bikes are cafe riders, right? I mean, they they were invented post Second World War, I believe, where these guys chopped up their their Harley yes. Davidsons, and now they didn't yep. have anything to do, so they did the ton. They tried to do you know these coffee runs and get there yep. as fast as they could. A lot yep. of people don't know that, and that's a that's a lovely story in and of itself, right? Mm -hmm. So these. Uh, lowered uh, handle uh, hand, these clip-ons now on these interesting looking machines that allow you to scoop down for the wind uh, racing from cafe to cafe i called this show that i was presenting um uh sorry preparing a presentation for uh, i knew you couldn't just do something and show someone in television hey can you do this it doesn't work that way right uh, you have to do a very um, well thought out presentation. So the first yeah. show was called Ultimate Cafe Rider, right? And it was a racing show. And I designed it in such a way that um, it was what I learned through my years of photography at these racetracks. If you have a camera, sure, people will pose for photos, you know, have their boat motorcycles uh, filmed, uh, but you can't get on the track. Uh, the track is there for the event. 20 guys are going to go racing. The director of the race is not interested in the director of the photography. Mm. He's not interested in production. Yeah. So I thought, all right, what's the best way to capture these fellas in their element is let's have them design a racing event that's a little bit more like a Reader's Digest version of a full race. So this is the interesting part. And when I tell people this, they, they think it's great. Uh, and um, I, I just thought it was natural to uh, go to this path. So it's a Reader's Digest version of a full race. So you get the um, instant gratification of a drag race because the races are only three laps long, but you get the corner for corner battles of uh -huh. two guys or girls going head to head from start to finish three laps it's like the best three laps of any yeah. 25 lap race so the directors once the race goes live then it's it's all the bikes it's all the riders right but just before that the directors are allowed to set up their cameras to, they understand what's about to happen it's short so if something goes wrong you can adjust, right? Mm -hmm. You have full access because we operate the event. We have full access to the track. Uh, it's a reduced track size too. That's another important thing. Um, th that's where you have to, you kind of have to get a strike a balance between the director and the racers because the racers, they want to go. They want a flat out, uh, you know, uh, an 800 meter straight away so that they can, pull out all the horsepower of their four-cylinder yeah. machines, right? So it's a, a happy balance. And some tracks layout, uh, you can reconfigure them so you get the long straightaways that the riders want. Um, and uh, the track, because it's shorter, it's always going to be a little bit more technical, not as much passing room, but the straightaways is where they can make that up. So I got the help of a lot of racers. Uh, they liked what I was doing. Uh, they didn't know where it was going to go, and neither did I, quite honestly. And uh, I shot my first teaser at a local track where we didn't actually do any racing. We just kind of simulated it. Uh -huh. um, it. The cost of renting the track, the insurance is why I did that. Yeah. Uh, but that gave me a, a one-minute teaser. I used that to gain more help more uh, interested personnel, more stakeholders to get this television show at the time. Uh, television has since changed since uh, the beginning. That was going to be some of my questioning, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah but we'll, we'll, we'll move into that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, we, we do have a nice streaming platform now, so we'll get to that in a sec. I'm really excited. It's the most exciting part of this whole thing. So I, ha I found it very difficult to, to get in front of these broadcast people who mm. make decisions, right? Mm -hmm. So the presentation had to get sharper and better. Uh, so the teaser was made, I got interest, I got more people on board. Um, and when I say more people, the, the first teaser that I shot, I had to have about 35 people uh, to be there to help out a lot of volunteers. Uh, I had to be really resourceful. Um, 
you got to rent the cameraman. You got to get the tech. Uh, tech guy to make sure he's managing the GoPros, right? Because you need lots of GoPros for this kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Aerial drones. So everyone knew it was happening, and uh, I laid out the date. It was a one-day shoot for this teaser, and it worked out decent. It worked out well. It was a, an interesting teaser we developed, and I got um, after that, I, I used it to uh, scout out some more people to come on board. Uh, wasn't successful in gaining the interest of broadcasters here in Canada. Uh, but uh, I said, okay, uh, uh, I know it's still, I know there's something here that I have, so I'm just going to keep, you know, mo going with the process and, and trying to bring in more people as well, like, it, like people that are connected. Uh -huh. uh, I met a few really cool uh, award winning producers in, in, in Canada, but it was, my idea is so radical. One of his main questions was, uh, and we went to bike shows together because he didn't quite understand why hasn't anyone done this yet, right? Yeah. He couldn't figure it out. And he was protecting himself because he didn't want to invest any of his time unless he quite you know understood why has someone not come up with this? Because the idea is pretty cool, right? It seems like it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but why has anyone done it? I guess there's no wing nuts like me available to, to do all this work and just stay with it and, and have the tenacity to, to keep pitching it and believe in it, right? Um, so he, um, he, in the end, after about a year of supporting me, he, he couldn't help me anymore. He, he bowed out and I said, okay, no problem, Tim. He's a great guy. I still talk to him. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's, he, he hasn't, he's, on, he's working on other stuff. Uh, but uh, he's still watching me. So um, I used that teaser. I, I did some motorcycle shows. After having win, having won a couple of uh, awards for that bike I built, I had a bit of a name that I had interest in motorcycles, and I seemed pretty passionate about it. So uh, they just hung out and some of these guys were saying hey you know uh, if you need a if you need to borrow a race bike for a show that you're doing uh, by all means ask me I'll, I'll come by and i got all kinds of people supporting me doing that so anytime i was renting a booth in a, a major motorcycle event i would call them up and i'd be uh, displaying my teaser and their bikes would be in the booth and i'm just trying right. to pitch it and get the word out yeah uh, it, it was a lot of work but it didn't seem like work to me because i'm just too passionate about it and i'm too motivated and crazy um so then uh so those bike shows did help i i met new people uh, a lot of filming uh, industry people and uh, i got them to help film a few more things for me to, to help expand promote. the, the yep. name promote thank you uh, <laughs> and that's that's when the name change one of the camera get one of the camera guys says you can't go with ultimate cafe rider uh, it, it's just too many words he goes you got to go with motorcycle wars and i yeah. said of course sure motorcycle wars everything is something wars right uh, storage wars, every kind of That's right. uh, yeah, yeah. skin wars, uh, tattoo wars. Anyway, so I said, okay, let, let's go with that. I wasn't super fond of it, um, but uh, let, let's go with it, right? Um, yeah, something just didn't really uh, sit well. It seemed like uh, I was sensationalizing motorcycle racing with going with a, a standard reality show title. But that's gotcha. what executive that's what executives want to see so i said all right let, let's go let's go with it so um i i had one i was using social media posting and teasing and nothing was coming out yet um so i um uh, i had this one comment uh, from one of the, the community members the racing community members he goes you know we're we're done with all this teasing why don't you just go and you know air something film the show man so that really it turned me on i said yeah this spring we're going to shoot the first show i'm going to call it a pilot but we're going to shoot a complete show and i don't know how i'm going to get the money to do it but i'm going to yeah. do it so um i had a lot of really good people bruce these people that have been involved with it they're just empathetic sincere authentic and they wanted it to happen yeah uh, so uh, i got a, lo a lot of support from producers, camera guys, I had to pay the camera guys because you can't get labor for free. When when you're getting that kind of labor, that kind of skill set, 
mm. uh, you 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 want to make sure that these guys are um, um, paid for their skills. So I rented a track not to, too far from my home, is in Grand Bend, Ontario. Owner was fantastic. Grand Bend, Ontario, the the Grand Bend uh, Motorsport uh, Park. And uh, yeah, we had about 70 people on the surface uh, of that venue that day. It was, uh, it was a Monday. I'll never forget it. It was a beautiful sunny day. It was perfect. Um, nothing went wrong. I couldn't believe it. From yeah. 7 a.m. <laughs> when we got to the track right to the, the end. At 4.30, this downpour, like Whoa. I have never seen before, uh, <laughs> My computers were all away. The camera guys were all put away. All, all their yeah, stuff yeah. was away. Uh, the tents were just coming down, and it just poured. And I go, thank God. Yeah, it was yeah, just held out for just, you. Just, oh, my God. I, I get emotional just thinking about it. So that day went really well. Um, planned it. Uh, planned it very well. Here And here's where story starts to evolve. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, and you can see this pilot, uh, it's actually not made public yet. I've been using the pilot. It's a 23 minute pilot. I've mm -hmm. been using it. Um, I actually did several cuts and some of the cuts from that day are on YouTube right now. Uh, and they're called motorcycle wars. Uh, but today, and this is a title that you're familiar with, um, blood, sweat, and gears that's right so yeah. the blood and sweat refers to the people right mm -hmm. the gears is the motorcycle so to me it's it, it's it's uh it really lends itself well the title to uh the compelling people that do this stuff um they're they're out of, most of them are out of this world uh, the characters and and i hope to to bring that story out uh and capturing the people that 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 do this thing so when I shot the pilot, I planned the event really well. It was a race operation. Uh, no one had ever done this format of racing. And I put money up for the guys, first, second, and third place. I think mm -hmm. the first place winner got 500 Canadian dollars, right. which is maybe uh, 20 euros. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> uh, but the, they, they, they were all in it, and they took it seriously. They were part of the design of how the practice was going to set up, how the qualifying was going to run, and how this three-lap race was going to run. So mm -hmm. I, I, was, I felt very confident that the riders were content with the format. And after filming it, after the day was over, everybody really enjoyed it. And uh, uh, there were some things that were going to change. And this is how you, you iterate through the process. You, you make it better and better and better by listening to people and, and making Absolutely. sure you, right. And you, yeah. you follow their, you follow their comments and uh, you take it to heart. You got to open your ears and listen. Otherwise you can't get much done. So Absolutely. Feel you, you do protect your baby, don't you? Um, I, I do it with, with the, the content I create, you know, with my little YouTube videos. You do become very protective of them, don't you? And I've, I've, I have seen myself sometimes, if somebody gives constructive criticism, sometimes you can be like, no, no, no. You know, you've, you've invested so much in it. You don't, you don't listen. You hear, but you don't listen. And sometimes, yeah, you, you have to take a step back, don't you, and go, actually, they got a point, and that's plainly what the audience wants. It's not necessarily what I want might not be what the audience wants. And for me, personally, sometimes you just have to adapt, you know, right. how you edit, how you film. The original conception you had for your podcast was brilliant and genius, but it wasn't perfect yet. And yeah. it had to it had to evolve from yeah. lighting to your camera angles to what you have uh, behind you, mm -hmm. um, how you ask questions, how you interact with your your uh, interviewees. Right. That's that's all an evolution. I'm sure mm -hmm. podcast number one is not as good as today. You know, I've, I've well, seen a few of them. They're brilliant. Right. I love your layout. I oh, love thank the you, way man. you. Cheers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. On that, can, can I stop us for a second? I just poured. I just poured my brew. Uh, right. It's uh, my favorite Canadian brew. Uh, cheers to you, and, and so thank I, you for here's the, to your uh, health. Should have done yeah. this right at the start. I do apologize. Yeah. yeah here's to your yeah. health, Jenny. Here's to your health. Sorry to interrupt, folks. I will be quick. It is sponsor shout out time. We are sponsored, as always, by Ultimate Add Ons. Bit of a blurb to read out for them. 
Ultimate add-ons are the premium manufacturer of mobile phone and action camera mounting solutions for motorcycles, with a kit for any bike and a proven track record of creating products that keep your devices safe, secure, and easily accessible. The Ultimate add-ons product range is ideal for any rider from the commuter to the round-the-world adventurer. Why shell out on an expensive GPS system when you could use your smartphone, keeping it charged and within easy reach to take photos of your travels at the same time? Ultimate add-ons, waterproof, shockproof and dustproof tough cases are available for all flagship smartphone models and are designed by riders for riders. Find out why Ride Magazine gives Ultimate add-ons their coveted Best Buy certification. Keep riding this winter with Ultimate add-ons. It's all about the journey. Now, folks, if you head to ultimateaddons.com and use the code TEAPOT110, you'll get 10% off. I've got an affiliate link for them as well, which I'll leave down below. So if you listen to the podcast, check out the show notes. If you're watching the vid, have a look at the vid description. And obviously, with the affiliate, I also make a slight commission off that cost you nothing more so a massive thanks to ultimate add-ons we are also sponsored by as always the influencer store influencer store handle all my merch you can see up there i've got loads of hats there's hoodies there's all sorts of things so if you head to teapot1.com head to the shop you can check out all the merchandise and that is all handled by the folks over at the Influencer Store. The Influencer Store helps you build your brand, big or small, providing you with a solution and apparel. We help you to increase your fan base while supporting you with starting your own influencer clothing line with nothing more than just an idea or design, and there are no hidden costs. For more info, come check us out at theinfluencerstore.co.uk or drop us an email at online at influencerstore.co.uk for more information. Again, there'll be links down below, folks. But lastly, a big shout out to all of you over in the clan, over on Patreon. As always, folks, I keep saying this, but it is true. I literally could not do this full time without your support over there. So a huge heartfelt thank you from me. If you'd like to go that extra mile and help support both the podcast and the main Teapot One vid channel, then head to patreon.com forward slash Teapot One. Again, links down below. A massive thanks to each and every one of you who's listening or watching the podcast. I love doing the podcast. I really do. And I love getting all the feedback from you from all the various different guests that we've had. If you could be so kind on whatever platform it is that you're listening or watching the podcast, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify in particular, you can rate the podcast on there. Obviously, a five-star rating goes a long way to help boost the podcast up through the ranks. And if you're watching the video, just give it a like, give it a comment, and both video and audio, if you share that with everyone that you think might be interested, that would be a massive help. All right, folks, let's get back to it. Right, um, there is so much that we can chat about already here, I think. I think something something I'd like to address now, if we can, before I forget. Yeah. You mentioned I about... TV networks and things like that. As you yeah. were talking and you, you said, you know, things have changed now. Obviously, TV, I mean, you used to have to get a network deal, didn't you? You used to have to get your content onto a TV network somewhere. Now you don't, do you? Because the streaming platforms, there's so many different streaming platforms out there. Netflix, there's Amazon, there's, there's everything you can think of. But overridingly, there's YouTube. So if it comes to it, you know, and you have the finances yourself to to create your project, you can just create your little masterpiece and whack it straight up there on YouTube for the masses to see. And yes. there's plenty of, of uh, revenue streams available through YouTube, not necessarily just advertising, but all the merchandise things that can come from it. The uh, There's just so much no available yes. now is that something which you've had to learn oh, yeah. adapt and and utilize yes uh very very important very uh critical part of this uh series of projects that i'm working on i've got a total of five projects that i'm working on blood sweat and gears is one yeah. of them and they're all related to motorcycle racing so you talked about youtube it is an awesome platform um, if you can, uh, if, if the, the return on the investment, if the return is there, um, it'll cost quite a bit to produce a, uh, 
uh, an event um, for these motorcycle races. Um, mm. So YouTube isn't a good enough platform uh, for that. Uh, the event itself, it, it, it's in the s several thousands of dollars. Um, so you need sponsorships. And today we call them brand partners. Mm -hmm. um, we, I, I looked for a um, marketing group of people, uh, and this is what the teaser, uh, what the, the, the pilot has helped me uh, get. Um, it's helped me get uh, major production companies who, who like the idea and who are willing to produce it. Mm -hmm. um, originally, the pilot, I did all the editing. I should mention that. I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, and I can't wait to publish this pilot. I'm just waiting for the go-ahead for that because it was my editing and I'm kind of patting myself <laughs> on the back. Um, I'm a bit of a hack, but I got it done good enough to have people understand what it is, this yep. crazy thing that I'm doing. So going back, YouTube's a fantastic platform, but in order to produce the bigger events, they're quite costly to generate. Uh, and we had to get brand partners and motorsports lends itself to brand partners it's a perfect mix right all the livery can you still hear me sorry yes yeah yeah okay uh, uh delivery on the motorcycles the banners the uh the interviews the the spec advertising so you can shoot you know for oil company or chain company or someone who manufactures uh cowlings uh all kinds of things right all related to motorcycle and some not related to motorcycle racing essentially brand partners want to know who your audience is yeah. so i have i'm working with a group right now they're fantastic people and there's another topic i hope we we get on uh bruce uh it's the people and then just character traits, but we'll, we'll come to that maybe a bit later. Sure. Um, working with wonderful people, you, you have to, you, you, you can't work with people that just don't get it. Um, life is challenging enough, productions are challenging enough to, to get into quirky little character traits that don't make things move well. <laughs> so we are now uh, in the mode of garnering brand partners for the for this uh, production uh, blood sweat and gears and they're interested and in order to bring value to um sorry uh, to bring value to the the production um you need a distributor youtube is good but it's not quite good enough for for our brand partners because everyone's on youtube we, they, we mm. need to be a little bit more on the broadcasting network across north america so um i can't mention the name right now because we're not in a signed deal but we are in a uh, in a really good relationship uh, he, uh, my, my company's name is FXR Inc. and we're film, uh, event production and film production. Uh, so we've negotiated a deal where I've become his uh, preferred independent producer. So all my projects have now uh, a distribution network on the, the most popular networks in North America. He's That's a fantastic. streaming platform. Yeah, he's a streaming platform and broadcast networks. Uh, they're all on broadband now. I've, mm. I've to my home. I've got uh, uh, fiber optic cable. Uh, every home, basically in southern Ontario and most across North America, on fiber optic. And if not fiber optic, at least cable is is good enough to stream pretty well yeah. anything. Which brings yeah. me to a point. If I could just interject, both of us, um, David Bowie. Right, <laughs> David David Bowie. <laughs> said something 25, 30 years ago, and I'm not sure if it was an award uh, that he was receiving, but he had just finished playing, he accepted an award, and he closed out his speech, his acceptance speech, with this really interesting uh, comment that I never, th that I recognized was important, but uh, was surprised that he had this insight. But he, he, he yelled out to the crowd, um, encourage your uh, lawmakers to get broadband to everybody, right? I'm paraphrasing, wow. right? Mm -hmm. He encouraged, he saw the value of broadband. U2 was at its infancy stages, I'm, I'm sure, back then. This is like 30 years. Correct me if I'm wrong. Don't yell at me if I'm wrong. Uh, but he, he, he made a statement, uh, and this is David Bowie, right? Yeah. He must have been yeah, a genius, right? Um, so he must have understood that we're all going to be in this position today 
uh, we need fiber optic cable to everyone's home and it makes uh, information accessible to so many more people and yeah television is what what's tv is it can exactly, we call it yeah. tv anymore he's, he's na- he nailed it then didn't he Bowie? He did. um, yeah it's pretty much an essential i think in fact it is regarded in the uk now i think it, it is regarded as an essential service so it's like it's something which everybody must have access to good right. speed internet yeah that's right uh, and it makes sense so um we have that my, my projects are on the cusp of being aired on on major networks, which is is good. Um, so I'm I'm very proud of that. That wasn't my doing. Uh, that was Emily, who I think you've um, uh, responded encountered. in the emails. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Statement Strategies, wonderful group of people. They saw my my sincerity, authenticity, and and my sincere thing to get this off the ground. Like I want to work. It's all I yeah. do now. Um, it used to be my side hustle up until about a year ago, year and a half ago, half a year ago. <laughs> it was my side. This whole p- film production, motorcycle event production um, was, a, was a side hustle. And I was working um, to try to get it off the ground. And I said, you know what? Now I've got some really great people. I'm yeah. really confident that we can do this. Pa- passion, passion for something is, I'm not going to say it's everything because you need, you do need more, but if you haven't got the passion for some, for something, it's just not going to happen, is it? Because um, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in this and I've had a lot of other people on who've, who've achieved amazing things in their lives, whether that's through travel, whether that's through, you know, generating their own businesses and their own brands and all this sort of stuff. But somebody once said something to me. They said the universe listens, you know. And if you go out there, at the time I was, I was feeling a little bit negative about, you know, leaving my full time job and going to YouTube and podcasts full time. You know, it was hard. It was during the COVID restrictions, and yeah. life was hard at that point. I mean, it still is, but you know, I'm, it's better. And um, he said to me, he said, you know, don't. Don't think about the negative things that are going on at the moment. He said, you need to have a positive mindset because the universe listens. And by that, people listen. Because if you if you don't think something's a goer, no one else is going to think it's a goer, are they? And they're, they're not going to invest their time, their money, their effort. They're not going to invest any of that into whatever it is that you've got because you don't believe in it. So you, you have to have that passion, don't you? And it will drive forward and you'll attract the right people who will also share that passion for it. And it will grow and grow and grow. Well said. You hit the nail on the head. That's everything that you've said is so true. I'll take that to my deathbed. I've heard (laughs) other very successful people say the same thing. You you have to keep a positive mindset. And that is not easy. So how do you do Mm. it? Stick with what you love, what your passion is. If you like tinkering on a motorcycle, if you like detailing your car, if you like playing your guitar, uh, if you like writing music, go deep into yourself and to what makes you happy and come up with ingenious things, right? Experiment, Mm. Uh, leave, leave the security. You have to take small risks, but calculated risks. Uh, Test your ideas with, with people. Um, You have to do it. It, it really is passion. Um, my nephew is living with me uh, for the, since the last three years. Um, he's challenged with academics. Um, he doesn't like it. He's a smart kid, but he gets bored. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, the latest lessons are: tell me what your passions are. I, I come down to, to. I've come down to this point. I'm trying to get what he loves to do because I found yeah. him find him moping around a lot and not really being happy. And I said, you know what? What do you like? I know I know you like to draw, right? So if he finds, I'm telling him, if you find your passion, you won't have the time or at least as much time to think about all the negative stuff, all absolutely. the crappy stuff in life, right? Yeah, just absolutely. just do what you love to do. Paint, draw, uh, write a song, work on your bikes, work on your cars um, uh, go fishing if you love fishing he likes to fish but he just doesn't get out or not uh, enough 
Um, I've taken him a few times, but he needs to get out more, right? Uh, at 14 yeah. years old, we have a small ravine in our backyard. Go spend some time in the in the water. There's lots of little tadpoles that you can find, right? <laughs> passion, Bruce. It, it, it truly is passion. You got to find it. And then when it, whenever you're doing what it is that you're doing, it's not work. Absolutely, and it's dry. It's the drive as well. And you know, I. Yeah, I get people because I, I I did this world trip some ten years ago. So people go yes. to me, oh, I'd I'd love to do that, but you know I can't afford it, or I haven't got the time, or I'd never, mm. you know. They put up the barriers, they put up the reasons why they think they can't, and I say to people like, if you have that mindset, it's never ever ever going to happen, and and it's not the be all and end all of just going right. I'm going to do this. That 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 isn't everything, is it? It's that. Okay, you've got to focus, you've got to have the passion. This is going to happen. I am going to make this happen. But you will come up against roadblocks. You will have many, many, many failures along the way. But I you think the to. difference, yeah, the difference between those who do achieve, who do attain, and those who don't, and there's far many who don't, is because when they hit that first roadblock or they hit that first challenge or what they see as a failure, they give up. Yeah, and that—that's the only difference, isn't it? You have to keep yes. going. Yeah, keep yeah. chipping away, adapt your plan, change the route, whatever it is, the strategy. Just uh, focus on the end game and work out the route in between. Yeah, the, I just finished telling one of my nephews that you got to focus on the end game. Mm -hmm. If you know where you want to go, right? You'll—if you see the path, right? I mean, figuratively, you see the path. You, when you come up to roadblocks, you have to find ways around it. Become resourceful. Right? Absolutely. Find solutions. Some of those solutions are super challenging. My biggest problem wasn't so much getting the network. It was finding the brand partners to convince them uh, to get on the call. you got to call hundreds of mm. businesses to say, would you like to support? Do you find value in what it is that I'm doing? Is yeah. this of any value in helping do what you do, sell your service, sell your products? You need to get people that get on the phone and, and do that and, and, mm. and, and pitch the show uh, offer value. Sometimes a thousand dollars worth of value you got to trade. Sometimes you're looking for thirty thousand dollars worth of uh, exchange of value. That's when when a business is going to fork out money. You have to tell them what's going on, how you're going to do it, and you have Absolutely. to build re relationships. Relationships, yep. and this is when when you come into the the idea of people uh, being face to face with them. Um, you you can't you can't earn someone's trust unless you experience enough of life with them so if they're a racer or if they're a race promoter uh or if they're production people you you have to win them over and it takes some time you got to talk with them they have to understand you believe you uh, you have to show consistency in your own character and you do that with uh with conversations i love going out to dinners with uh stakeholders um and and that's when you get to know what's in my soul and what in his is Absolutely. in other people's soul right yeah 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 i i always remember when i was younger and a lot more social than perhaps i am now you know when you're you're out in the bars and the clubs and you know you you're enjoying life and you're in yeah. your late teens 20s all through your 20s and i remember sure. you the real friendships at that stage they were solidified when you were out, when you went out and you had some beers and you really got to know that person. As you get older, as you said, you're going for dinner with people, aren't you? You're spending time with people and, you know, discovering who they are as a person outside of that business connection that you initi maybe initial, initially had. But yep. yeah, that, that for me was like, you know, a good few beers and a night out or a couple of nights out with people, that's when you really formed the bond with them, wasn't it? That's when yeah. they become like friends. They're not just acquaintances yeah. anymore. They become the friends. And once you start working with these individuals, yes. solve, solving problems together, that brings you deeper to each other as well, yeah. right? Yeah, so. absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. um, this, this yeah. initial idea that you had then, yes, with the three-lap race, is that still... Is that yep. still going to be the makeup of Blood, Sweat yep. and Gears? 
Yep, yep, exactly. Uh, so I, I've just finished uh, delivering to a venue uh, two formats, one for a one-day racing event and another for a race weekend event, a three-day uh, event, like uh, mm -hmm. with bands playing, brand partners selling their products, so like a, a major event. Um, I have a background of motorsport event production. Back in the day, and this was a, a three-year little component of my life from 1996 to 1999-ish, I, uh, I purchased um, these little Formula Fords. They're little mm -hmm. uh, four-wheel, uh, th they run on Pinto engines. They were quite interesting cars. They look like little Formula cars. It's like after go-kart racing, you go Formula Ford racing. Are you familiar with Formula Ford? I think I've heard the name before. Yeah, there's lots of different levels, isn't there, before you get up to like F1. Yeah, and, yeah. right. So because I'm a, I'm a, a nut when it comes to motorsports, I said, you know what, why don't I mimic what a guy in the States is doing and offer rides in these cars at a local parking lot? So I, I organized about 50 odd events. I, uh, a local parking lot was vacant, and uh, I actually – paved a section that was about 425 meters a little road circuit where these formula fords they had four first gears in it now imagine this these cars do 180 kilometers an hour but on a 400 meter track they're not going to be doing that but you still yeah. want to get the experience to these riders who are paying you about four or five hundred dollars canadian to stay with you for the afternoon so i put four first gears in them slightly different ratios uh, but you know gear one is gear one gear two is still gear one gear three is still gear one and gear four <laughs> gear one right <laughs> so i was able to change the ratios on these things but you still got the feeling of shifting gears yeah, you didn't yeah. need it but you were doing it and the cars worked <laughs> really well so that brought me to how to organize events so coming to today i understand the value of safety uh the efficiency of an event uh how you have to really make sure that everyone is on the track where they have to be to make sure the production runs smooth and that's why i was able to pull off that pilot so well and that's why um, i i show confidence to the other people that are stakeholders in this that we can do this we've done our tabletop they call it the t tabletop event where you mm. reenact the event on a table you just you follow the timeline it's a it's a 10 hour day so every hour you've got to tell them this is what's going to happen uh in within every hour from yeah. race one to race 15 but we start early in the morning with the racers meeting the next thing is the film production people's meeting and then uh, you have to get uh, craft services lunches and meals for everyone uh, you need to get hotels for everyone it's quite a oh, thing to do right? it's a logistical nightmare by the sounds of it jerry are, are, do you yeah. are you literally taking all of that on yourself or i'm assuming you have people I did. in place that right yeah I, yeah i i did the first one i did it all myself and that's why yeah. i was telling you how proud i was i got a lot of help from lots of people but i was heading it up um can and i, I ask? paid Yes. Can I ask something? How sure. how hard did you find relinquish 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 I can't speak relinquishing <laughs> that control and allowing oh. other people into your your sort oh of oh my god via to handle all that? that I'm a bit of a control a... freak, and I, I yep. find it I could yep. really do with help editing editing my videos, but I yep. don't want to rel relinquish that to anybody else. So. I say three words to myself. <laughs> yeah. Progress over perfection. Mm. I need to progress it. I can't do everything, right? So that I remember the day that we shot the pilot, I did no, I, I one thing I should go back. That pilot, I shot the event. Remember I was telling you about story? Maybe we'll come back uh -huh. to story and how important yeah, yeah. story is. Because yeah. nobody will listen to me unless I cover compelling story. Right? Mm -hmm. That's critical for everything today. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Right? Nobody will watch anything unless there's story. That's why mm -hmm. podcasts are I've seen some of the comments that you get from your listeners. They love listening to two guys, seemingly mm -hmm. nice. I know you're nice. People have to <laughs> figure out that I'm not a bad guy. Right? They love listening to two gents talking over yeah. a beer. 
About so, anything as well. About anything, right? Mm-hmm. So relinquishing uh, um, the the power to, to get stuff done on that day, uh, you got to let it go. If you want to progress, you got to let it go. And as long as you pick the nicest, smartest, skilled people, uh, you could let it go. I mean, that's... Mm. Now, a lot of them were volunteers, but they were the kind of people that I would agree to work with. And yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. telling you, nothing went wrong that day. Right. All the batteries and the cameras were fine. All the memory was perfect. Um, yeah, the only thing that went wrong was my fault. I planned that day really well. I planned for the event, and I captured the event on film. I did not capture the storytelling Yes. And that's the failure of the pilot. Mm. And you know how you have to fail? Well, mm. I failed very nicely there. And I know that really well. And today, my five projects is only one thing. It's about real people. And I'm pointing to my other TV screen that I've got open there. Uh, real people, real stories, not just motorcycle racing. Yeah. So five projects. Can I read you the title of these projects? Because they're kind of yeah, cool. Please do. All right. So the, the first one is called, and this is the YouTube broadcast. This, this property that I'm going to read to you, I'm working with a fantastic guy who lives out in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, he's an announcer. He's a voiceover guy. His name's Lindsay Thompson, and I will promote him like I will promote anyone. He's fantastic. He's an amazing human being. Uh, it's called Profiles of Motorcycle Racers, and it's simply podcasts and studio interviews with racers and just mm-hmm. trying to get their story out. And that little property, that little um, uh, podcast or interview, studio interview thing, uh, lends itself really well to the other five properties that we're thinking about doing as well. Because it's really, how well do you interview on race day? How well are you pulling out stories on race day, either mm-hmm. before the actual event or post the event? I've got a small trailer that has a, a mobile studio in it. I'll be yeah. driving to the racers' homes. They're all fairly local, a uh, couple hour drive sometimes, but uh, it's a mobile studio. If I don't get what I need, or if I want to get some post-race interviews or pre-race interviews, bring, drive the truck out to them, three hours and I'm done, maybe mm-hmm. four hours, and I got to do a little bit of editing. But the next one, the next property, which is really cool, uh, is called Motorcycle Triathlete. It's, uh, this is going to be a, a, a bit of an interesting one to, to assemble, um, but it's super bike racing, super moto racing, and dirt bike racing. So as a competitor, you've got to do all three disciplines. Wow. Almost like, you could, it's almost like, um, uh, are you, so you think you can dance? Mm-hmm. Or, uh, you know, those, those typical reality shows. Yeah. Well, you got to show that you can, one of those skills you're going to be really good at. Uh-huh. Right. And it's usually the super bike racing because that's what's at the heart of all our projects. So that's one project. And another one called Race Operations, it's a documentary format. Uh, that one's a go um, because when you shoot documentaries, you get uh, the Canadian Media Fund supporting you. Um, here in, in Canada, the, uh, there's got to be a certain amount of Canadian content and they support independent producers Not producing. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Right. right? Um, Uh, Another one, well, Blood, Sweat and Gears, that's the number one that we're working on right now. And it's scheduled for this this summer for the first uh, event. Uh, And Toronto City Super... Sorry, in 2023 it's starting? Yeah. Wow. I thought it was next year. uh, It might air next year, right? But um, I'm going to try... I'm going to give it my blood, sweat, and tears to get it uh, <laughs> to air this though. year. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really my goal is to air it this year, so uh, I'll I'll do what I can to to make sure it airs this year. Um, and there's a there's an inner city supermoto racing series that what, that happened years ago. Um, I think it's a really cool idea. Supermoto. Um, do you know what supermoto is? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. We have over okay. here. Yeah. I, I, it's very big. KTM's got a, a beautiful motorcycle, uh, this, uh, the 690 SMCR mm-hmm. version. 
Yeah. Uh, I am a new proud owner of that motorcycle, <laughs> I have to say, and I haven't been able to ride it yet. Oh, my God. Oh, what? This, yeah, the, the weather is just turning now. It's just starting to get warm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I scraped my pennies and I said, I gotta, I've always loved the idea of a dirt bike on the road. That that's to me is the ultimate hooligan, yeah. hooligan uh, uh, type of wheelie deal. central. Yeah, and then the last the last one is the. Uh, uh, have you seen Ovale motorcycles? They're mini super bikes. They're really yes. cute, big in big in Europe. Yeah, uh, Peter Heckman, the TT racer. He, yeah. I think he has started a series to yeah. um, to try and develop youth racing, and it's Correct. based all around Ovales. Yeah, right, right. And Canada, there's a a wonderful person named Tony Sharpless who's who's promoting that level of uh, racing. Incidentally, um, there's a really interesting podcast for you. Now that I dropped her name. Um, you might want to reach out or maybe I can talk to a few people to point her in her, in your direction. She is one, she is one heck of a Canadian hall of famer, uh, really smart woman, um, an amazing super bike racer as well. Mm -hmm. She's had a wonderful career and she's heading up this Canadian mini super bike series. And I hope to talk to her. I haven't talked to her yet about it, but it's called little giants. I think it's little giants racing against the odds. I'd, I'd love uh, to. I'd be very interested in chatting. Yeah. All right, good. I, I'm going to make that note, and I'm going to see if Emily can't uh, hook us up or hook you up. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, those are the projects we're working on under the umbrella of FXR and Statement Strategies. If, if it wasn't for them, they were the missing link in my mm. tenacious attempts at getting this to, to air. Yeah. Um, I love this adventure. I love the whole process. Um, I like the challenge. I'm hoping uh, for success in, in a different way. I mean, I've been successful garnering the attention of a lot of important people. And any grand scheme, like I was saying, um, is going to need some grand help and grand people and quality yeah. characters. Um, and I'm, I am certainly working with really good people right now. So the format of the show, I know in the initial in the initial sort of blurb, uh, w which I read, it, it, it was um, promoted as the professional racer. You'd have some yeah. professional racers and yeah. some amateur racers, and they would head. They would both, yeah. you know, in in their own little leagues, and they would head, go race head to head. Excuse me, against each other culminating at the end with the yep. winner from the amateur winner from the pro and they go head to head is that right wow brilliant you nailed it that's <laughs> it right so i got that from um uh, there's a, a motorcycle forum uh, here in canada it is the biggest one it's called gta motorcycle and mm -hmm. donna donna skinner the 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 uh, owner and operator of it um she uh, I, I talked to her a lot uh, and at one point, she told me about, you, you got to get the little guy going against the guy who's so successful. That's what people want to see. Story. Right, right. Yeah. I said, Donna, yeah, you nailed it. And, um, and ever since then, uh, I, I reformatted how this is going to work. So you, you, you said it. The amateurs will practice on their own, and the pros will practice on their own. Qualifying yeah. will happen for the amateurs, then qualifying happens for the pros. So... As an audience member, you're watching the amateurs, you're watching the stories build, you're knowing mm. who the amateur good guy is, who the amateur yeah, bad guy is. All the characters who, developing. Yeah, yeah, the characters are developing, and it's real, it's authentic, and we're going to capture that story building, uh, the arc of the, of the show. Um, and you're going to get the uh, superbike racer who's licensed for you know 15 years, it has got a really well supported motorcycle likely is uh, sponsored by uh, the factories or at mm. least they're they're giving him a lot of support uh so he's going to be doing times that are much faster so that's why you have uh the profiles developed of just the pros and then just the amateurs so you mm. get a champion amateur and now you got a champion uh pro and they've all been you followed along they've won a certain cash prize and the cash prizes are significant uh that's another thing to to make sure that 
uh, the audience is interested. They want to see someone offering up, you know, some good mm -hmm. quality cash. And uh, I'm not talking a thousand dollars. It's got to be a bit more than that. Uh, these riders, they spend a few thousand dollars every weekend, and they're not making any money. They, these it's insane, isn't it? Here yeah. in the UK, it's the same. Even, even at like an amateur level, for a weekend, it's well over a thousand pounds just in tires. Just in tires. You said Phenomenal. it, right? So. As a production, uh, uh, I, I have to respect that, and I want to make sure the brand partners are going to understand that. And it mm. is about story, so we're going to offer significant uh, prizes, uh, cash and prizes. And that, that, to me, is an absolute must, and I, I've made that very clear to everybody. Um, so, yeah, so you got a pro and you got a, an amateur champion. So now what are you going to do? Well... Let's have them negotiate a race, right? That's interesting in and of itself. The contrast is really cool. So let's, you know, like, do you, I don't know if you've ever seen a, an American production called Pinks. This is very much like Pinks. No, um, not except all of that. It, it was a really good show. It, I'm sure you can find it on YouTube, but yeah. uh, I really enjoyed watching it. The uh, producer was fantastic. He was able to, you can see his passion bringing out the the energy in these racers this was just drag racing and uh, they had to gamble they had to you know they, he gave them a thousand dollars each and uh, -huh. uh he goes gamble it uh, look do something right like how much do you think you're gonna win right it, it was really interesting to to watch and sometimes they would race for their pink slip at the end if you lose your car goes to the winner oh. um, i wouldn't do that with these guys uh, it's <laughs> no. not about that uh, it's about winning, and I mean, super bikes are awesome enough, and that that's wonderful enough to watch. So, we'll have them negotiate uh, an amateur. He knows what he's capable of. The, the pro, they've been all watching each other. They know what they can do. So, set up a lead. Send up a, a, some kind of a handicap. Mm. Uh, so, the the amateur will get maybe five uh, bike lengths, maybe half a track. Uh, who knows? Um, and all these races are normally three lap races, but maybe the final race can be five laps to give the amateur uh, and the pro and the audience a little bit some a, a little different uh, uh, expectation. They don't they haven't seen a five lap race yet, so yeah. you know what, yeah. what's going to happen there. And there's one more twist. Do you know what a squid is? A squid is a street racer who's not licensed. But he goes to the track and he thinks he's better than everyone. Okay, right. <laughs> and often enough, they get taught sometime a, sometimes a harsh lesson and right. they crash out, right? So, um, so in this whole story, we have a little extra tidbit of contrast to add uh, as a, as a wake-up call to anyone who is a squid, right? So we're going to have squid six racers who are not licensed compete on their own right so six guys will compete they'll go through the practice the qualifying they're kind of outside of the competition but they're there and everyone's mm -hmm. kind of noticing them for whatever reason um, so we'll have after the competition's done by the end of the competition by the end where the pro and the am gets to compete the winner of the final blood, sweat, and gears, is going to offer the squid a race and offer them a challenge uh, that they think they might be able to do, and there's going to be a bit of a prize. So the squids are not really winning anything. They're not, they don't have the respect of these racers who are licensed and who put in the hard work, but we're still going to invite them, not mm -hmm. make fun of them, but just, you know, when you're trying to teach someone wisdom... <laughs> And and you never know. There could be a bit of a a, a turn in the tables. You never know. <laughs> there could be right. So it's a little unpredictable, and it just yeah, adds, yeah. adds a little extra flavor to the to the whole show. Yeah. Uh, so the one day Is, event. Sorry, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, no, please. No, I think you've probably oh. answered my question now. Yeah. Okay. So the one day event will have all of that occur um, in about uh, maybe ten, eleven hours if we're really lucky. Uh, okay. And it's rain or shine. It's rain or shine. And these guys, yeah, yeah. they know that. 
Right, well, yeah, my, my question was going to be, is it going to follow like a traditional championship format where you go to like a different circuit uh, each week or each month? But you've you've answered that. It's all within the one day broken into however many episodes. Boom, done. Correct. That's right. Gotcha. And that's where the efficiency of film production comes in. Right? Absolutely. We have to, it's the balance thing. You produce an interesting event, yeah. an authentic, it's got to be sincere and authentic. And then... You, you you need a rate of return for your film production because it's quite costly to, to do that. Absolutely, editing alone yep. is fifty percent of the cost, um, and you got to you got to. I mean, you you want to have respect for the story, so you want to deliver the story. You want to write this video essay the best you can. Mm. So it, it takes it takes a uh, hundred dollars an hour to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So right? is this open to purely North American uh, riders and racers, or are you going to open this out? Worldwide. And how do you get involved? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, Emily, the Statement Strategies, uh, is worldwide. They mm -hmm. have offices in the States and in Europe. Okay. Um, so once they've packaged what we're doing here, this property, once we've packaged this property, it's a mobile production. Mm. Uh, we can do one day and three day events, three day events anywhere. So yes, we're going to go to other tracks. Uh, it'll take a plan. Uh, but we're, I know that the, the head of statement, Matthew, awesome guy, he's already thinking, uh, North, uh, the States, uh, mm -hmm. Canada is a wonderful place. It's where we live. Uh, it's great Canadian content, but, uh, we will invite riders from anywhere in the world. Um, we have riders that are interested from the UK. We have riders riders that are interested from uh, Australia. That's a bit of a trek, but uh, <laughs> if 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 we can uh, if it garners a lot of interest, we'll, we'll have the um, uh, prize money and prizes mm -hmm. for the riders, and that's what they're looking for. They're looking for um, their television time we want incidentally the livery that exists on these motorcycles um that they get local sponsors we're inviting their livery on their motorcycles to get the airtime that they they think they can offer their their mm -hmm. people so if whatever it takes for them to get more money or more support from from their sponsors tell them that you're going to be aired on this show and hopefully it'll it'll work for them too have have you heard of another British podcast called uh, Chasing the Racing? Have you ever heard of that? Um, they they are I've probably heard. the biggest like racing podcast, certainly in the UK. I don't think I have. I I've done a podcast. It it was I, I it wasn't Chasing Racing. I would have remembered if I had yeah. done the podcast. Uh, it was chasing something else, but chasing the right. racing, I don't think I have. They, they really would be they would be great uh, lads to 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 chat with because they they have a, a massive reach, way bigger than than me. Um, sadly, it, it, it was the brainchild of a, a chap called Chrissy Rouse. That's his his cap yeah. up there. Uh, okay. But sadly, he he lost his life uh, oh. late last year. Um, in one of the British superbike races. But the other chap, Dom, Dom Horbertson, who did the podcast with him, he's now keeping it going and he has a number of other sort of guest hosts that come on from okay. the, the field of, of motorcycle yeah. racing. Dom is a TT racer. He's a, a road uh, racing specialist. But it's it's a really, it's like this, but a lot better. It's it's very relaxed. They live and breathe racing. And that that is your core audience right there so um yeah. i'll i'll try and put you in touch with with dom and, and the team actually um and you know if you could get on okay. there would, yeah. that would be fantastic exposure for the uk racing market for sure. sure if i could now that you mentioned uh, the these people in 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 the real i'm going to call it real racing because it's mine um i had to be very careful in the beginning um I don't want to sensationalize what they do. Um, wh what I want to do is it with, with authentic support. I want to help support local racing. I want to mm. um, help people who don't know what racing is. I want to 
air my products, my properties in such a way that it garners interest from people who normally don't have interest in racing. So we call those indifferent people who are passing by the channels or they surf the, the tube, uh, the YouTube for interesting stuff and they pass mm -hmm. over motorcycle racing that they normally wouldn't watch. But for some reason, the storytelling is what keeps them viewing what what we're we're trying to do mm. so it's very important for me to communicate to the racing community that i respect what they do and i want to uphold the essence the theos of what they do mm. right i want to make sure that whatever it is that i air it's not sensationalizing it's it's not uh, diminishing what racing really is and yeah. it's it's about the people's passion and doing what they're doing. So that's why uh, I had to make sure whatever it is that I did, the racing itself, the race event, the operation of the race, had to be what the racers wanted. It mm -hmm. can't be uh, it, it can't be unauthentic. Um, yeah. For example, if I was to take bikes on a, a parking lot and race bikes there that that just wouldn't make any sense you, you couldn't do this in a parking lot it yeah. would be really cheap it would be really inexpensive for a producer to do that but you wouldn't capture the essence of what they're doing no right? not at all not at all so when i speak to people like your friends there and like the racing community um it's really important that i make sure that i communicate that i'm not trying to um produce something that uh, changes the essence of what racing is really all about sure. this is like an all-star event if you will right um we're doing this so that we can help market and it's expensive to shoot so let's let's make it work efficiently for the directors and producers and at the same time let's produce something that will interest more people to watch your grassroots racers and yeah. uh and, and attend the the local racetracks that that's one of the critical steps man i i am i am excited to see this i i really am like i think what you're conveying there about the story behind everything that's there the racers um you know there's so many different stories that, that you could you can convey isn't there there's there's the the racers themselves there's the pit crews that are all there there's the brands that are involved there's the marshals that are going to have to be out in circuit there's the race control there's you and your directorial team the production team that are all putting it together there's so many different sort of human aspects and human stories that can all be pieced together to, to you... create a really entertaining package if you group a, uh, if you assemble a group of passionate people yeah passionate people have gone deep into something they love yeah guess what you could they can tell that story mm. you've yeah. gone deep in what you do right i haven't mm. talked to you about how you've technically pulled off a beautiful looking uh screen right i mean it looks fantastic the lighting you use is really really good Right. My my wife will be laughing because I I painted all these walls, but de I'm not good at detail. So the cutting in when you paint, I'm terrible at. So <laughs> if if you were to take the camera up and look between the grey and the white, it's all overlapping. You know, it looks terrible. She <laughs> and she she's just like you can't you can't put that on camera. And I was like, no one will see. So she was. I was like, no one will see the finite details. All people will see is that border. That's it. They're not going to see all. It she looks like, oh, good. Thank you. Cheers. Bruce, no, <laughs> and the crown molding looks ideal. It looks really good. <laughs> Cheers. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, right, and, Jerry, we have yeah. questions yeah. to get through here. We've just oh, been okay, having okay. a gas ourselves. Do you have time okay. to go through some questions? Hundred percent. Right. Lovely. Go nuts. We've got a few over on my over on my Patreon. So. Uh, thank you very much to the clan members over at uh, patreon.com forward slash teapot1. First one, Charlie yeah. Callard. Now, I don't pre-read these, Jerry, so these could take us absolutely anywhere. Okay, that, that's fine. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, Charlie Callard. Evening, gents. Hope you're both fitting well. All good. Thank you, Charlie. I've got to say, your rowing in the morning knackers me out. But just seeing the stories, fair play, keep it up. I've I've got back into, I've got a rowing machine in my garage. So in oh, the morning... Good. I go out and do twenty minutes, half hour, just trying to just trying to shed a little bit of weight here. So, uh, cheers, Charlie. Thank you, pal. 
Question. A couple of questions. What are the best and worst things about riding in Canada? Oh, wow. Uh, that's, I, I, got some, I got some answers for you. Uh, <laughs> right now, uh, the weather is turning. Um, the last snowfall was just about a week ago, and the salt is still on the roads. Yeah. Salt is treacherous. I, I, I was telling you earlier that I got this brand new motorcycle and they delivered it. It's so shiny. It's so beautiful. I'm dying to go riding it. I've started it a couple of times. So about three weeks ago, there was a warm day, plus five degrees Celsius. Uh, the road was dry, but it was powdered with white salt but i mm. said you know how much damage can i do right i'm just going to go for a quick ride so yeah, salt didn't... salt destroyed the the cleanliness of the bike i spent two hours cleaning it and salt is of course nasty for aluminum mm -hmm. and uh these these rims on this bike are aluminum it gets into the nicks and crannies of all the spokes and i didn't want to have to deal with that again so i am waiting for the first major rain and it's happening today it's raining Beautiful. right now here in toronto there's still some snow but the salt is being washed so salt is really important and we're in uh, the end of March here. Um, riding season for the for the the guys that are really into it. They've already started and they're very careful. But uh, mid April is probably when it really gets rolling. And the other thing is in spring potholes because of the salt, the heaving of the asphalt uh, yeah. up and down. You're going to get all kinds of potholes. So it's uh, very dangerous when it comes to your riding line and potholes so you got to be careful yeah. with potholes my uh, my overriding memory of riding in canada uh, when i when i did my big trip was there was this freak weather front hit north america basically so north of the states and into canada so i came from chicago up towards is it winnipeg sort of Yep. in the middle-ish and then from sure. there i was i was heading west right across the great plains but yep. as i crossed into winnipeg the temperatures, this was about April time, the temperature dropped and it dropped from, you know, like eight, nine, 10 degrees. I think with wind chill, it got down to minus 38. And I had, I mean, the Great Plains, you'll know yourself, there's nothing there. I think I had four or five days of just riding Flat. a GSX-R1000 in a leather wow. suit in minus 38. It was wow. horrendous. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, you got to layer horrible. up. Well, wow. I, I, I literally, I would ride for 10 minutes and then I would spend 10, 20 minutes with my hands on the exhaust trying to like thaw my hand because I had no heated grips. I had nothing. Yeah. So uh, I, I, everything, all the heated grips had stopped working by that point. And it was just, it just took me forever. My original plan yeah. was to get up into Alaska and then go up to Dead Horse. But because it took mm. me so long to even get to like Calgary, I was just so far behind by that point that I think I went, I went as far up as just before Yukon, and then I had to turn round and head south and back to New York and go that way. Right, but stunningly beautiful place. What a beautiful country you live in. <laughs> Thank you. It's <laughs> flat, but it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> not over in the not over in the west, like BC. No, no. Wow. yeah, BC is beautiful. Yeah, oh, that's where stunning. Lindsay Thompson is right now. Ah, right. Okay, okay. Yeah. So what would you say is the best thing about riding in Canada? Ha. Huh. Ah, oh, the best thing. Um, the, uh, the roads are not as dangerous when it comes to cars. Yeah, you can pick Highway 401 and the 400. you got to be careful. But there's there are a lot of roads north of the 400, uh, sorry, of the 400, 401 uh, series highways. Um, so the, the fall is a beautiful time with all the color changing. Mm. Uh, but, uh, some of the, the Northern roads are really quite beautiful to ride. Um, especially with the season changeovers. So s spring is really quite lovely, but fall is really nice. There's not a, lo a lengthy riding season here in the, in the, uh, in Canada, just because of the, the weather. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, um, um, I, I, th I think the, the fresh air is, is quite nice here, and uh, I, I enjoy that. I, uh, what's the, what's mm. the wildlife situation like over there? I mean, where mm. you are over in – are you in Toronto, did you say? Is that right? I am in Toronto, just slightly north of Toronto. So um, do, you, do you have 
like the, the the grizzlies and the moose that you see over towards in the the west and up in the yeah. north. You can get you can get moose. You can certainly get black bears. A uh, right. lot of deer. A lot of deer. There are signs on every road when you're traveling north. Yeah. Yeah. Watch for the deers jumping across. Yeah. Um, so uh, <laughs> this one time I was riding. Uh, if it was anything else, it would have it would have certainly hurt my wrist. But I was on my throttle. And uh, just doing a, I wasn't speeding. I was just doing the standard uh, speed limits of within the speed limits. At least that's what you I'm are, tell officer. You. Yes, officer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at a certain point in the summer, uh, you have frogs jumping towards headlights of wow. passing by cars. And I, I had never experienced this, but I'm riding along straight path easy peasy no problem and i see this thing jump out i didn't know where it was going to land but it was right onto my knuckles and it just bounced off it was a soft it was a very soft hit it didn't hurt and i didn't know what I bet it was it hurt the frog <laughs> oh i think it did right it was a <laughs> hell of a punch for me that's for sure uh, so i've had frogs jump out at me never a, a deer but you got to be careful yeah, we yeah. get a lot of deer here in the UK. They're they're everywhere now, deer. <laughs> I I actually had uh, I was down in Romania last year, mm -hmm. and um, I was riding uh, the Transvagarisin Highway over there. It's a beautiful, amazing, stunning military road from I think it was built in the sixties or seventies, and um, it's just a stunning stretch of road, 70, 80 miles long. Well, I was working my way up towards the mountains and I, I came across a whole load of, of bear at the side of the road, like oh, proper wow. brown bear, like female mum brown bears with all the little cubs. And the first time I saw one, I sort of stopped the bike, turned around to go back and have a look. And then it, it dawned on me that, this is a wild bear. You know, I'm not in a zoo here. So yeah, I should probably turn around and keep moving. But it was not amazing to see these these beautiful, huge creatures out in the wild. I'm just glad the bike didn't break down. I just came back from San Diego, and San Diego uh, Zoo is mm -hmm. an amazing thing to to go and watch. It's really? uh, they yeah they have open air. So I've just seen grizzly bears and. Um, lions and it's just like in the open air they, they don't have any um like cages. the cages mm. yeah it, it's it's a different format that the, that the zoo uses to keep the bears away from the the, the human beings yeah, which yeah. i believe are quite tasty to them <laughs> um yeah so yeah wild animals are amazing and if they've got their cubs the the bears and yeah. you turned around <laughs> yeah yeah uh, probably wasn't my finest move to do something like that yeah <laughs> Right, on. Uh, right, Charlie's got another question. He says, what's your favourite Canadian food or meal? Ah, okay. Canadian. Well, um, I, I visit Montreal quite a bit, and Montreal's uh, the French, uh, yeah. French uh, are very uh, famous for their poutine. So it's uh, French fries and gravy and cheese, and oh, a wow. lot of cheese and a lot of gravy. It's uh, a popular Canadian uh, thing to have uh, so yeah and of course Canadian beer <laughs> you gotta have Canadian <laughs> beer I think it's the best quite honestly what what, what is that what's it is, it, is Molson is Molson yeah. a Canadian beer is that right yes it is yeah Molson yeah, yeah. Canadian yeah gotcha gotcha yeah so um, that for Canadian food I, I'd have to call call it that poutine so yeah chips cheese and gravy that's it yeah, heart attack. <laughs> there'll be northern, there'll be northerners here in the UK going. God, yeah. yes, absolutely. That's that's their staple. They live on that <laughs> chips, cheese, and right. gravy. Right on. Uh, cheers for that. Cheers for that, Charlie. Next one, Lee Vigor. Hi, both. Hope you're all well. What do you see as your greatest achievement to date? Oh, oh, that's a cool question. It is, isn't it? Yeah, they come I, out with some corkers. Yeah. No. Um, I would have to say learning about myself and how to understand and listen to people because mm. this great thing that I'm trying to pull off, you can't do it alone. It's about how well I um, work with people and you have to let your ego go. You have to become, um, I mean, you have to be an empathetic person. You have to be able to listen. And when you're listening, 
Listening doesn't mean listen and then develop a defense for what they're trying to say. You Mm. have to listen and then regurgitate in your mind what they're saying and spell it out for them. So this is what you're saying. Correct me if I'm wrong. So if you're going to tell me something, try to teach me something, I'll listen and then I'll repeat it in my words. So I think one of the greatest things I've learned is the importance of the connection between people that you're working with. Mm -hmm. Um, And in life in general, you want people that are not toxic, right? You you want to work with people that are happy. You want to make sure that you make people happy. Uh, There's passive aggression is not in me. I, I don't know how to do it. I'm not a sarcastic guy. Mind you, fi- uh, sarcasm is very funny. I have most of my friends uh, that I, I'm not working with on these projects. They're very funny people and they use sarcasm. You got to be able to take that hit. I oh, think, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so. You got to be able to laugh at yourself, haven't you? Oh yeah, you really do. You can't take yourself too seriously. You got to know we're all, we're all flawed and uh, yeah have fun you gotta have yeah. fun definitely mm. um you, you mentioned something there initially when you were talking about um uh listening to what <laughs> listening to what people are, uh, are saying and it made me think about uh, sort of a, a a fault i see in myself quite a lot in that you know my my medium is youtube that's where my video, you know, all my videos are done up on on YouTube now, and I interact and engage with my audience via the comments most of the time. You know, there's I've built up a nice little community who who through my Patreon and stuff, we go away and we do ride outs together. People come on oh, tours wow. with me, That's but there's wonderful. also a lot of people I've never actually met face to face, but I just know the usernames, and it's it's something that has really struck home with me in that. You can take the written word in so many different ways. It's so different to having like a face-to-face conversation like this, even like this via video calls. You know, the written word, it can be interpreted totally differently depending on how you're feeling at the time, on your, your state of mind at that time, all manner of different things, can't it? So I'll get comments from people and sometimes I think, Oh, you cheeky bugger. You know, it's like, you know, you take it personally. Are you having a dig at me? But then once you have a little bit of to and fro with somebody, and as you said, you engage with them to try and understand what it is that they're saying rather than what you think that they're saying. Right. A lot of the time you can ascertain that, oh, actually, they're not having a dig. You know, they've got a perfectly valid point. And right. you, you have to adapt to it, don't you? Yes. But I do find social media, when you said it was, to- that was what it was, when you mentioned to- to, uh, like the toxic nature sometimes, uh, and social media can be yes. incredibly, it can be incredibly toxic. But on the flip side, it can be, it can be such an amazing tool to bring people together, to, to uh, broaden people's horizons and expose them to different countries, different religions and cultures and just different ways of life eh? and different yes. lines of thinking that different people can have. But it's a delicate balance because it, it can be used for bad and it can be used for good. And yeah, oh, yes. you, 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 can get it. It, you can get it wrong. Yeah, that was a um, great question. Lee also says, what's at the top of your bucket list? Top of my bucket list? What yep. I must complete? Yep. Well, right now, the, the, <laughs> yeah, I think the, I know the, what it is. The, yeah, the, the the top is getting this thing off the ground and aired and having people like it. Right? I uh, I um, this is not going to be my last attempt because I believe this is going to be the attempt that works. Mm-hmm. Um, I failed enough at trying to garner the. Uh, the energies of groups of people, but I found the right group of people and they have the skill set. They are competent yeah. individuals. Um, Matthew is a super competent person. He's got the energy to, to get it done 100%. And the people he's working with, they're also uh, really energetic. So the number one thing I, at my bucket list is uh, uh, besides writing that KTM, is getting this uh, getting this project aired and uh, the getting this getting ready to do the second one somewhere other than Canada? That awesome. is absolutely at the top of my bucket list, and that's a fantastic question. 
This has been, is, is this right then? It's been the best part of 15 years that you've been actively yes. working at this. Yes. Yes, wow. it has. Yeah. Wow. Um, and I don't want that to make it seem like uh, I didn't know what I was doing completely. It's, uh, it was for the better part of that 15 years, it was my side job. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. one of the uh, one of the things I looked at what 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 was making this thing fail for years, I was uh, analyzing. And uh, I, the last thing that I couldn't change of all the elements that I was able to change to, to make it less of a failure uh, was uh, the one thing I could change was quit my full time job and mm -hmm. go full time and find the right people. I found the right people and that's what motivated me to say, I'm going to go full time at this now because yeah. I've got someone uh, pitching the brand partners yeah. uh, and they're in film industry people. So they know about film and production. They don't know anything about motorcycle racing, which is mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and uh, I've been their source and I'm not saying that I know everything, but I've just been exposed to a lot of it uh, by, by any means. I, I, uh, I've just been around racers. I know what they do. I don't know how to do what they do. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. So did I answer that question? You, you did. Yeah. I mean, that, okay. we basically, we spoke a lot about this before, didn't we? It's in yeah. that, yeah. you know, the, the difference between those that, achieve and those that fail to reach their dreams uh, yeah. you don't you don't give up never give up that's it you just that's just it. keep going keep going that's develop it. develop yeah. learn yeah. expand yeah. change adapt yeah adapt yeah, yeah. change gotcha. find resourcefulness nice. uh, money's always a big stopper right of money course. yeah right yeah. um i'm just a joe schmo and uh I, I make some money but not the kind of money that it needs to mm. to pull off these kinds of things and uh I wouldn't be smart to invest your own money. You got to invest <laughs> other people's money. So you got to you got to bring value to them in order to throw their uh, investments yeah. in. They have to get so, a return for it. Yeah, and that's been the biggest roadblock. And I've never been so confident to overcome that roadblock now with uh, Matthew and Emily working and helping this this these projects, which is awesome. fantastic. Yeah. Right, we've got a couple more questions. Are you okay yes. for them? Yes. Right. Yes, Chris sir. Kemp. Hi, guys. Hope you're well. You've just been made joint leaders of Mars in the colonization. What traffic <laughs> laws do you make, if any? Wow, that's random. That's, that's random, but fun. That's yeah, it is. fun. Okay. Traffic laws on Mars. I would make, can I answer one? Yeah, uh, when, they're when they're designing the roads, there's got to be a special road for motorcycles, no oh, speed yeah. limit. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. And directional, directional roads, single lanes, enough for two bikes, mm -hmm. right? Uh, like, you know how they have bicycle lanes? Toronto's full of uh, bicycle oh, yeah, yeah, lanes, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, I love riding bicycle, but riding in a bicycle lane is no different than riding in, on the road. I, mean, I know they're sh supposed to show more respect for you, but I don't think maybe drivers do as much as they should. But mm. I would want a motorcycle lane yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. It always, it always amazes me in the continent over in Europe. You go to places like some parts of Spain, um, sorry, all of Spain, some parts of France, uh, some bits of Germany and stuff. Their roads, Austria, all these sorts of places, their roads are like, the, the, it's like they were designed by a biker because they're phenomenal. Oh. Well, not even just a biker, you know, but, but like somebody who, a, a real driver or a real rider, someone that, that has a passion for, for the twists and the turns, because yeah. the roads are amazing. Here in the UK, oh. they would just have point A and point B, and it would be a straight line, like the Romans. It would just be a straight yeah. line. That's the most yeah. efficient. That's the way we're doing it. But yeah. over there, now nah, we'll go around this mountain, and we'll go up through the valley, and we won't just build a bridge. <laughs> Let's work our way through the canyon. And you're like, oh, that, this is the that, way to do it. It's amazing. That sounds, that sounds great. Yeah, There is one area in, in the GT in, in southern Ontario that is, yeah. is like – Europe. It's like I, I call it a mini Europe, where the roads are just like what you described. It's a, a, a valley, a, a credit valley. Um, I think it's Forks of the Credit. That's what it is. Uh, Bell Fountain, Ontario, uh, Forks right. of the Credit. 
it's, it's quite a nice place to ride. It's, it's definitely a, a destination ride for me. Anyway, sorry. I, I like the idea of no speed limits. Like in the Isle of Man, you know, uh, where they have the TT. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Where you have, we call them nationals, like the national speed limit. So in the mm. UK, the national speed limit for a standard road is 60 miles an hour. But if there's, if there's a, like a physical uh, partition between the two lanes, you know, you've got, you've, you'll have, you could have one lane going that way and one lane going that way. But if yep. there's like a, a physical, yeah, not just a barrier, barrier but, but it, it, as long as there's something physical between those two lanes, then it becomes 70 miles an hour normally, oh. you know, oh, but okay. in the Isle of Man, when you see the sign, which is like a white circle with a black diagonal line, that means national speed limit. When you see ah. that sign in the Isle of Man, it means there's no speed limit. You can go as fast as you like. Now, I think that's brilliant, but obviously you're going to have crashes. You're going to have people that don't know how to ride, don't know how to drive, and you will inevitably have accidents as a result of that. Yeah. I think I like the idea of, you know, when you get to that national road, fill your boots, off you go. <laughs> it's just yeah. if the idiot takes somebody else, like an innocent person with them, that's yeah. that's when it becomes, yeah, is it yeah. ethical? It's, it's, there's a portion of drivers, I think you yeah. said the word, that are idiots. Yep, totally. Uh, and uh, you, you got to take that into account. I mean, the saying is one bad apple spoils everything or yeah, one yeah. bad something spoils the <laughs> Yeah, bushel. something like that, yeah. So, um, yeah, so you're, you, you, sadly, that's that's what tracks are for, right? You want to go nuts on a motorcycle, go to a track. True. But yeah, yeah. if true, it is, true. if it, if there is, a, a, if we're on Mars uh, and it's breathable air and you've, you've tuned your motorcycle engines to breathe the same air, then uh, when Did you're you designing roads, that? yeah, <laughs> when you're uh, uh, when you're designing the roads, please make uh, motorcycle lanes. Absolutely, yeah, without speed like limits, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or have one day a week when it's just bikes, no other traffic oh, allowed. They should do that, that here. Be. I yeah, know. I, I say that all the time. I wish they would do that. Oh man, yeah. or even just right. a weekend. When we go into Mars, <laughs> let's do it. Come on, Elon. Let's sort it out. Yeah, Elon. <laughs> Right, cheers to that one, Chris. Next one, Tony Hannum. Hello to you both. Hope you're keeping well. All good. Thank you, Tony. My question, would you be happy to let the big production companies buy this off you or would you want to keep it under your control? I'm sure it's hard with sponsorships and TV ads and licenses to not lose control. That's an excellent question. Uh, And I'm going to answer it from my heart, authentically. Um, Whether I have ownership of this stuff or not um i still will always love motorcycles motorcycle racing i still will fabricate my motorcycles i will make myself happy no problemo i uh progress over perfection i would uh have a lot more money in my pockets to build more (laughs) motorcycles is what i'm hearing and what i'm thinking uh move me to new projects but uh i'll tell you the best part of what it is that i'm doing is the 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 conception the evolution uh, the iterations to make it better and better Mm. um i've owned a lot of it up until now um i'm still at a point where uh it's going to go out to the the masses um, who has ever, uh, who has seen it, snippets of it now, really like it. So I've succeeded uh, in, in, in a lot of ways already. Um, it, it hasn't paid the bills, but I wasn't doing this to pay the bills from the get go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If I was, I would have stopped a long time ago and maybe <laughs> bought some kind of stocks or something focused in on that. But it's not about the money. Uh, but money gets you to do stuff right Mm -hmm. Um, that's why you work that's why you save your pennies to buy that ktm Um, so um, it it feeds you but uh, i'll tell you uh, what was the fellow's name chris tony 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 sony Uh, sorry tony Um, i uh i'm all ears if someone wants to consider taking over Um, (laughs) and that's the honest truth um I don't need to control it. If it still lives on, 
I've given birth to something so cool. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, that's my honest answer. It's not like I'm selling out or no, anything no, no, like that. No, I appreciate that. Nice yeah. one, Tony. Cheers for that, pal. Uh, yeah, cheers. Next one, Debbie Clegg. Hello, how you doing, Debbie? Question to both of you. If you were approached to run a motorbike company production-wise, what company would you really like to be in charge of and why? Oh, okay. Um, I, I, I recently had a conversation with uh, someone who uh, owns a television network, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. uh, and he is part, uh, he's part of the, we have a, a big race, an Indy car race here in Toronto. Um, it's called the Molson Indy. Uh, the beer company still yeah, supports yeah. it, right? And uh, all the famous uh, drivers come up to Toronto uh, to to hold a city race, and it's really cool. So uh, there's a feature race that um, they have a, a vacancy for, and um, he suggested Supermoto, uh, a Supermoto race, not a Superbike race, because Superbikes and walls don't really like each other. So, but Supermoto, which is a form of a dirt bike, you have a different sense of control and you could probably pull it off. So, going to the question, what type of manufacturer is that? Is that the question? What mm -hmm. type of manufacturer? Yeah. I think the uh, adventure bikes are awesome, but uh, there's a trend, and KTM is showing you that trend. I would want to hop on a super street legal supermoto styled uh, motorcycle. Um, get into that production somehow. Uh, I would, I would, I would like that. If it's, if it's, if it's a now thing, if I had to invest my time and, and money into a company that's producing motorcycles, I would probably go with someone who's producing those uh, hooligan bikes. Yeah, yeah. Um, hey, KTM. KTM um, address that very well, I think. They, yeah. Like, I, have, I have the GS, but I put my hand up and I say that the KTM version of the GS, the KTM Super Adventure, uh, I like the S, but you can do the R as well. You know, the mm -hmm. 1290 Super Adventure mm -hmm. S or the R. Um, mm -hmm. I think that bike is, I think it's a much better bike to ride. It's more engaging. It's just Fun. It's a hooligan, and KTM, yeah. KTM nail that that sort of. It's that it factor which I think yeah. a lot of other yeah. bikes, including the GS, don't have. You know, like the GS is ninety percent fantastic at everything that it does, but I don't walk away from it, turn around, and go, "Oh yeah, let's get back on. Let's go and get you know." <laughs> Whereas something like the KTM. That's a bike that when the garage door opens and you see it, you're just like, oh, we are going to have some fun on that. So, yeah. yeah. They nail yeah. that. Absolutely yeah. nail it. So in regard in regards to, let's say, you're looking for a return on investment for mm. a production motorcycle, adventure bikes are are really picking up in sales in Canada, as right. well as the bike, uh, the uh, the hooligan uh, supermoto bikes. Their yeah. their sales are increasing, and sport bikes. You're probably getting this in Europe as well because of insurance costs. Sports bike sales are are, are down. Um, a yeah, lot of the we... factories w mm -hmm. won't support what I'm doing because it's all related to racing, and yeah. the sport bikes aren't selling. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, we've we've had a steady decline in sports bike sales for a good decade or so here yep. in the UK, and the adventure bikes have just been. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, have they peaked? Part of me, part of me thinks maybe adventure bike sales here in the UK have mm -hmm. maybe peaked because I'm mm. seeing a lot of people who have adventure bikes starting to move to other type of bikes like. Mm. Your your sport tourers, you know your things like uh -huh. your uh, your Honda Goldwings, your um, uh -huh. yeah, uh, like the Honda Cross Tourer, or something like that. Just because yeah. that's a lot the VFR. cheaper. The, the VFR, VF, uh, yeah. I mean, they don't make the VFR anymore, do they? I, I, I think they've stopped making 
Oh, I think Honda okay. stopped making the VFR. Mm-hmm. I think. Well, you maybe call it different over there, but the, what we call the VFR 800 here in the UK, okay. I okay. don't think they still make that bike. They might be mm-hmm. bringing it back. But um, mm-hmm. things like the BMW RT or the RS, you know, those sort of sport touringy type bikes, I, mm-hmm. I'm kind of seeing that that is the emerging market again here in the UK. Um, could be wrong, but I, I, I think that's where things are going to move to. It. Plus, Sales in lower CC bikes, believe it or not, are starting to really pick up here. People are rediscovering a love, like grown men, people our yep. age, us, yep. uh, and women, that they're starting to rediscover a love for small CC bikes and yes. just the pure fun of it. Because yeah. Yeah, 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 you yeah. can you can wring its neck yeah. flat out and you're not yeah. going to get done for speeding. Yeah. You're just having yeah. fun, aren't you? You hit, you hit the nail on the head because we're seeing that here. 300 right. CC machines are very yeah. popular. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, we're starting here in the UK. We're starting to see, I'm definitely noticing it. There's a younger market coming in. There's a lot of, of uh, women coming in as well, but there's mm-hmm. definitely a much younger market starting to come into biking. And mm-hmm. um, I'm not sure if that is because of the the increased appeal of small cc bikes i don't think it is because a lot of them are riding big adventure bikes now but there's mm-hmm. definitely a younger market coming in which is fantastic it's brilliant it's what it's what the motorcycle market needs isn't it is fresh young blood in it yeah so yeah i, I think it's interesting times for for biking for me of, um yeah. sorry go on apologies go on no i was gonna say i was talking to uh the president of suzuki canada uh, ah, about right. a year about a year ago mm-hmm. and uh, i'm getting my mo- most of my industry information from what he was telling me in that in that meeting yeah. and uh people are looking for experience and that's mm. why the adventure bikes um are, are are becoming popular here too so i i think there's a the younger generation they don't they don't even really want to own anything uh sure. they don't own yeah. homes they 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 uh, they they rent a lot and they're they're living for the experience and that's what adventure bikes give you right yeah I, I think COVID COVID has had a huge impact yeah. on on people's outlook on life and yes. like the philosophy on life and whereas yes. I think pre COVID we were everyone was was totally invested in their careers and everyone was money orientated, wasn't it? And you've got to work hard because you need yep. to get money behind you and you need to save for tomorrow and you need yep. to plan. And then COVID came and it's like people have just gone, do you know what? We might not get that opportunity to do that dream trip or go and do this or start that business or whatever Born. it is. And people That's are just, right. boom, let's do it. Let's just go yep. for it. You nailed it. Bruce, mm. you absolutely nailed it. I, I am yeah. certain of that as being a new psyche in, in, in today's younger people as well yeah. as our, our age, for sure. I, I hope I hope we don't lose that. I hope we don't fall back into the old way. You know, right. it's it's nice yep. to see people are just going for it. They're, you know, they whatever it yep. is, they're just they're going yep. for it. Yes. Cool. Um okay, Debbie says, other question, crisp sarnies, yes or no? Now, do you know what crisps are? Like in over there, do you call them chips? Potato, chi- uh, potato, potato chips, chips or French potato? Or p- yeah, potato uh, chips. It- okay, love them. And uh, so, uh, what's the comparison? Um, no, she said over here we have a thing called crisp sarnie. So we'll take potato chips and put them between yeah. two slices of butter bread, and that's a sandwich. <laughs> 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 but some people over here are like, no, that's horrible. But it's no, amazing. I, it's I awesome. Have, I have done that. Um, yeah. Years ago in high school, I dated a uh, an, an English girl. Uh-huh. And uh, she had, I, I think it was cucumber and bread, or chip booty. Chip booty. Yeah, yeah. It's chip booty. Yeah. So, butty, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah I, I put cucumber. I've also put uh, potato <laughs> chips in bread. Yeah. yeah, it. I like the crunchiness, the crisps, right? So yeah, Guilty. potato chips and cheese, like cheddar. If you put cheddar with potato chips in in a sandwich, amazing. Okay, amazing. <laughs> old old cheddar for sure. I love yeah. it. Don't don't listen to me about dietary advice. I'm like I'm blooming three hundred pounds. You don't don't uh, listen to me. <laughs> you look fine from here. <laughs> Thanks very much. Oh yeah, you're a swooner, you. Right, second last question, Patrick Column. 
So with race bikes becoming an endangered species, what bike or type yeah. of bikes, not the remaining 1,000cc monsters, would you bring back for competitive racing? A Screaming 600 is great, but to me, uh, a 750cc inline four bike seems a, seemed a class where there was a decent power, but the bikes weren't so fast it became an expensive replica to buy on Monday. So, yeah, what, what sort of CC would you think is the optimum race bike? Well, I love inline fours. I love mm. the sound of the 80s and 90s and before then, uh, Formula One engines, right? Mm. And the closer, the, 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 you'll get close to that sound with any Japanese inline four. Yeah. Um, I've, I've got a GS400F, I think it is. It's a 400 cylinder. Uh, sorry, a 400cc uh, four-cylinder right. engine, yeah. and it's got a rev limit of 18,000 RPM, Jeez. or maybe nice. maybe it's 17, but it's yeah, yeah. way up there. Uh, I love that motor. As a matter of fact, that motor is the only reason why that bike is here. It's a it's called a Bandit Suzuki Bandit. Uh -huh. yeah, uh, yeah. It's a 1991 model, but uh -huh. I love the motor. To me, that engine is small cc. And it sounds, when you run an open header on that thing, it sounds like a Formula One car. It's just a sweet musical tone to it. Yeah. Um, so if there's an engine that I would love to drop into a, a really well suspended motorcycle frame, um, like a new model, I would use that engine. A, a, a small C seed inline four. And I believe back in the day, uh, Honda made a six-cylinder 250. Wow! If did I'm they? not, yeah, I, I I could be mistaken, but uh, they made like a six-cylinder tiny CC engine, and you got to hear this thing. YouTube it uh, when we're yeah, done well, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah it, 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 I'm I'm pretty sure it's uh, like the CBX was a beautiful six-cylinder engine. It was a pretty big motor. It stuck out the side of your frame, mm. but uh, small CCs inline four at minimum um and there's plenty of motors to choose from good reliable engines like that yeah. gs 400 um so is that the uh, answer to the question that, yeah 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 mm -hmm. just whatever, yeah, okay. whatever one you think yeah. yeah um i'm i'm a big gsxr fan I, you know I've, i was always a gsxr boy so uh, i had if i can tell you about my first yeah, gsxr 1988 gsxr wow. 750 that was a beautiful bike. Loved it. Um, maybe I'll get another one in the days. Maybe I'll find one if you if I'm lucky enough to find one in good shape. I, I don't think it. there's I don't think there's a better sound. You, you've you've you pretty much mentioned it there. A better sound than a than like a a GSXR for me. It's a GSXR thousand screaming right up in the revs, as you said, 14, 15, 16,000 revs, way up there in the in the the rev yeah. range. Just that growl you get. It's really it sounds yeah. like a blooming sounds like someone out of Star Wars when it goes by, doesn't it? I yeah, it. yeah, I absolutely love it. Right, cheers for that one, Patrick. Last question, Jerry. Last sure. question. Right on. Beat English. Oh, we've not heard from Pete in a while. Pete has always got some good questions when he okay. when he posts up. Question good. one. He's got he's got yeah. two for us. If okay. you were given the chance to choose the adverts in your show, who would you ask ah. and what would you choose? Oh wow. Okay. Um, well, interestingly enough, the the process of finding brand partners and sponsors for this type of a show is uh, we all put our heads together and we think, what products do we like? Right. Think of everything that you like and that you use on an everyday basis and give me a list of those those uh, products. Mm -hmm. And this is what was requested uh, uh, by me, uh, not by me, sorry, by the people that are working on trying to find sponsors. So mm -hmm. whatever you like, whatever you can associate with, if you use Apple computers and you really love your Apple computer, write that down. We're going to solicit them for possible interest in our show because mm -hmm. we use their product. Um we're obviously looking at it's it it certainly is about motorcycle racing and the brand will likely be one that can associate with motorcycle racing but remember we're editing this thing in such a way that it's really not so much about the motorcycle racing it's about the people mm -hmm. and people use 
any product, all products, women and men. So we have women that are competing as well. And um, so when it comes to what sponsors, I can't really give you a specific name other than if I like Molson Canadian, well, guess what? I'm going to be, we are going to be calling them. Um, if I use a type of soap, if I use a certain type of chain uh, on, on, on when I repair bikes, I'll be mm -hmm. calling them. So we just created this massive list, and then you just start calling them. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's amazing how uh, when you have the right backing, when you tell them that you are going to be distributed on a not just YouTube, you're you're you've got uh, a, a, a letter of intent uh, with these broadcasters. Uh, then um, you, you, they take you seriously. And as long yeah. as you present your material, right, that's what Matthew's team does. This, uh, this project has been so well polished. Uh, like you can communicate the idea pretty quickly, excuse me, on a, on a simple fact sheet, right? This mm -hmm. is the property. This is what it's about. This is where it's going to air, right? And these are the key stakeholders, uh, they got to see who you're partnered up with. They want to mm. see they want to see sanctioning bodies. They want to see uh, production companies, and they want to see the broadcasting network. They want to see that you know there's people organized. So once you do that, they see that this is a professional organized prop product. It's not a guy at the initial stages like I was 15 years ago. Yeah. Uh, then they'll listen. So regarding what products. Um, the, the certainly any any products that currently support racing we're going to address we're going to address them for sure because we want them to continue supporting the grassroots racers gotcha. but uh um hey if i like eating at that restaurant i'll go mm. to him do you want to do you want to be a little bit related to this thing or you yeah, know yeah, or yeah. a lot yeah. or a lot related <laughs> <laughs> no makes sense man makes sense that's a um, great question last question again from pete english yeah. if your family and friends found out you'd been arrested what would they assume you'd done <laughs> that's a crazy question um arrested not just ticketed like i'm in jail come pick me up yep Bail me out. Cow. um <laughs> jesus it's definitely, I have to say, because I haven't been arrested, but I've done some funny stuff on a motorcycle that maybe <laughs> I shouldn't have done. Uh, it only required a ticket in that moment, but uh, I could have taken it, you know, to a level of stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll be motorcycle related then. Yeah, likely. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, that's all I can think of now. That would be... That's a nice, safe, safe answer. <laughs> yeah, okay, let's keep it that way. Oh, Jesus. Awesome. That's, a, that's a funny question. Kudos to him, man. Uh, you get... you get Because I open this up. Obviously, I have my Patreon community there, the clan, but then I'll also Lovely. put it out on my Instagram and my Facebook, and you uh, know, members of the public can submit questions as well. So you yeah. just never know what sort of questions you're going to get. In these. Yeah. And these, I've traditionally not pre-read any of the questions, so they're as much a surprise to me as they are to to you, that you know the Great. guest. Yeah. But I am starting to think I should maybe pre-read and form form some form of plan um, around the questions. You know what? I I really like the off the cuff. I right, really okay. like that. Right. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you get to choose if you see a question that's ridiculous. Yes. It's just some some scammer. You just won't read it, right? Yeah, but yeah, that's right. Those questions you read off, I think all of them were authentic and awesome to ask. Fantastic, right? thank you. And I think it 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 shows. I think I think it shows the human side of yes. of us. You know, yeah. uh, people know me, but like you yeah. as the guest, they're getting to know yeah. you through this conversation, aren't they? So it's yeah, um, yeah it's it, it just shows the, the human element of it. Yeah. Um, right, Jerry, that is two hours, man. We've been we've been chatting away for. No, I don't yeah, have a clock crazy, in front of me. Yeah, yeah, it's five past nine oh. here in the UK. So oh, okay, five it's past three four? minutes past five. Okay, wow. Five, well, 5, oh, right. 5, 5 p.m. Dinner right. time. Right. Um, okay, so uh, blood, sweat, and gears. When yes. are you able to say at the moment when this is going to be aired, when people are actually going to be able to watch it? 
No, I cannot, but no I can direct them to uh, to the fxrtv.com website, and that's got uh, dates that'll come out for sure. So fxrtv.com. Beautiful. And this this trailer, this promotional piece that you were talking about, where yeah. can people watch that? Yeah, so on YouTube, uh, mm -hmm. if you type in Motorcycle Wars, mm -hmm. um, you will likely find it. Um, right. So MotorcycleWars.tv. Uh, was a website that we were operating. It might still be operating. I haven't checked lately. It, um, it, it, it is, but name. it's not fully operational. You know, it's, yeah. there's a couple of bits you can get from it. Okay. So, like I said, we're really in the cusp of the change. We just changed. We rebranded what this Motorcycle Wars was going to be, and it's now Blood, Sweat, and Gears. Right. Um, and that's what we're going to be promoting. Uh, that's what we have been promoting for about three months now. Okay. Uh, and uh, there's no there's no social media platforms built around yeah, that as yet, yeah, or is there? Th th they're being evolved. Um, gotcha. They there were many in, in Ultimate Cafe Rider. There was Motorcycle Wars. Yeah, and now you. it's now if it's actually I think there's Blood Sweat and Gears. Each property will have its own social media, but FXR TV has its own social media. Gotcha. It's quite a thing that I'm trying to package, and um, I, I I would love to talk to you again once we air. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm 100% up for that. Okay. Yeah. I'd love to tell you what other hurdles we have to climb because there's few more coming. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to develop, isn't it? Into season yeah. two and since season three and onwards. Yeah. yeah brilliant. Yeah. Folks, um, if you're listening to the podcast, check out the show notes. If you're watching the YouTube bit, have a look at the description and I'll put, definitely I'll put links to the FXR TV um, website and I'll find this promo and I'll put it down there as well. So you'll be able to watch a promo and get a little taste there as to what is coming our way by the sounds of it it's going to be something special i'm really looking forward to, to seeing it and watching how it all evolves it was such a pleasure talking with you bruce it was really nice and i could send you i can have emily send you those links uh to some That'd of those fantastic. promos okay Brilliant. i'll make sure i make that awesome. no, no problem Likewise, Jerry, it's it's great to talk with somebody who has such a passion and a vision for 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 you know a project. And it's you can tell this is this is everything for you, isn't it? I mean, fifteen yeah. years you've been working at this. Wow. It's a lot. I cannot it's a, I cannot yeah. wait to see it, mate. Right on. Thank you very much, Bruce, for having me, man. Absolute pleasure, bud. Absolute pleasure. Um, do you want to give any shout outs before we before we end? You know, feel free if you've got I, any uh, shout outs you want to give. Just, just I, I really want to support the racing scene here in southern Ontario, the uh SOAR group of SOAR racers, S O A R. Um, they're uh Ken McAdam, he's a fantastic guy, he's the operator of it, the, the CSBK. They're the uh, the national series of racing here in Canada. Uh, all the racers are great. A lot of them have supported me. So thumbs up to those guys because without them, I couldn't do this or anything close to it. So awesome. that's the key people I'd like to thank. Team effort, team effort. Right, mate, I wish you the very best of luck with this. I mean, you, you don't need the luck now. I'm sure it's oh, all no, there. It's all there. Cannot mm -hmm. wait to see. Um, thank right you on. very much for coming on. Thank you very much for sharing your story and telling us all about it. And we cannot wait to see how it all develops. Thank you, Bruce. Right, folks, hope you've enjoyed this one. What else can we say other than keep doing your thing, keep looking after those that you love, get on out there whenever you can. But most importantly, most importantly, Live your life and don't give up. Woo-ha! Dude, that was mega. Thank you very much, man.